Hi, and welcome to the screencast for Skin. Uh, before we dive right into Skin, I have a little bit of science news to cover. Um, this may be outdated if I leave this video up for multiple semesters, but I'll talk about it now anyways. Um, so these two scientists right here were just awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. They are going to share it. Um, it is Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, or Doudna, not exactly sure how to say it. Um, so the two of them collaborated, they worked separately, um, but in a coordinated fashion to develop this totally cool new, somewhat revolutionary gene editing technology called CRISPR. Um, I won't go into the details of it because if you're not a molecular biologist, you are not going to understand it, but it is very powerful and very cool. Um, what they did was they noticed that certain bacteria had a defense mechanism whereby they could recognize viral DNA and then cut it up into little bits so that viral DNA um, couldn't be used to replicate virus and then take over the cell. They then took this defense mechanism and combined it in the lab with some other cool DNA technology to make a group of proteins that work like molecular scissors that not only cut the DNA like the bacterial defenses did, but can then splice in a new sequence. And it can be programmed just using DNA molecular technology, which you all don't understand yet, um, but it can be made to cut at any site that you want it to and then insert any sequence that you then insert along with it. So it's really cool, really powerful, um, and just an example of like one of the best things I like about science is when somebody notices something cool and then also realizes that's something that can be turned into a tool. So not only is that bacterial defense mechanism cool, but they have harnessed it and combined it with other stuff and made it into a really powerful weapon. So it'd sort of be the first person that thought, you know, cat gut, wood, and pointy rocks could all be put together to make a bow and arrow. Um, so it's really just advanced tool making. It's what a, what's up? What? excuse me, what us humans have been doing since we've been humans. So it's really cool. Just thought everybody should know that. All right, but then we're just talking about the skin, which is nowhere near as interesting as gene editing, but it's probably important if you're going into healthcare, you're going to be dealing with people. The first thing you're going to notice about them is your skin because it's on the surface. So we'll talk about it. Um, so the first thing you want to know is we have this list of, I think it's six functions of the integumentary system. Whoops, let me go back to the beginning. One of the things that I will try and remember to start doing now that we're getting into actual systems, right? Up through chapter four, um, it was just background, cells, chemistry, tissues. Now we're talking about systems. One of the things we want to get in the habit of doing is thinking about how those systems serve the body as a whole. What is their role in promoting whole body homeostasis? Because it's easy to get lost in all the nitty gritty of every system. We want to step back every once in a while and think about what that system is doing for the body and, and where it fits into whole body physiology. So first up, for the integumentary system, Right? It protects your body. It keeps the outside out and the inside in. There are different kinds of protections that it offers us. Um, so there are chemical protections that come from the sebum and our sebaceous glands and other secretions. Uh, the sebum is somewhat low in pH, and that is supposed to be called your acid mantle, because low pH means acid. Um, skin obviously also just forms a physical barrier, and then there are biological barriers such as dendritic cells, which we are going to go over. Um, oh, those really are macrophages. That should be just one thing. Um, but at any rate, dendritic cells, macrophages, melanin, um, other biologically active 
um, chemicals or cells that provide protection to the body. Um, your skin also functions in body temperature regulation. This is where most of your, actually all of your sweat glands are located, and sweating is how humans keep from overheating. Um, because you have a lot of blood vessels in your skin, it can also be used to help regulate temperature that way, where if you're overheating, your body sends more blood to the skin, your face flushes, and then heat can radiate out away from you more efficiently because your blood is carrying it to the surface. And then if you get cold, the blood vessels that serve your skin are going to constrict, less blood will be sent to the surface, and you're going to hold on to more heat. Cutaneous sensation is just that. It's sensation. Uh, but our skin allows us to interpret the world around us. Um, Skin also helps us produce vitamin D. Um, so vitamin D requires, I should say, the synthesis of vitamin D requires that UV light hit one of the precursor molecules and the energy from that UV light is used to break some bonds so that bonds can be rearranged to form vitamin D. This is why vitamin D is called the sunshine vitamin, uh, again, because you need the UV light from the sun in order to produce it. Um, it says right here, uh, we were already talking about how the blood vessels in your skin can serve to radiate heat away. They can also serve as a blood reservoir. Um, so one of the things you, you want to think about maybe, or just to give you an example, um, your blood pressure you want to have stay relatively constant. But if you chug a whole bunch of water, all of that water is going to end up in your bloodstream and you need some excess capacity in your vasculature in all of your blood vessels to accommodate all of that water so that your blood pressure doesn't go up when you drink a ton of water and so that your blood pressure doesn't plummet when you get a little dehydrated so you have more blood vessels than you would need at any given point in time so that if you do superhydrate, um, you've got excess capacity to store that blood. Then excretion. Um, this one I really don't like that much. You can work, you can excrete nitrogenous wastes just fine without sweating a lot, right? We all make it through winter without sweating a ton, and we don't have nitrogenous wastes built up. Um, Wastes are secreted into the sweat because your body needs to create an osmotic gradient between the gland and the cells lining the gland so that it can get the water to move. Recall that water doesn't get pumped anywhere and your body can't keep the water where it wants it to. So what your sweat glands do is they pump a lot of nitrogenous waste along with salt out of the cells into the lumen of the gland, then what is left behind is very watery. So they create a concentration imbalance across the membrane of the cell, which then encourages the water to flow by osmosis out of the cell into the duct of the sweat gland. So the nitrogenous waste is there, not necessarily because your body needs to get rid of it, but it's something convenient that your body can pump to generate an osmotic gradient and get the water to move. All right, what's next? Uh, we're just going to go through the different parts of the skin, epidermis, dermis, hypodermis. There's no new information on this slide. Really no new information on this slide. Um, you should have already had lab by now, so you're already familiar with the layers of the skin and the tissue types that you find in each layer. So we'll go through that rather quickly. But well, there, we just went through it. Um, for epidermis, you will recall that we identified the epidermis in lab, but we did not go over the layers of the epidermis. For lecture, you will be responsible for knowing the layers of the epidermis. Um, so they're listed here, basale, spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, and corneum. 
Um, I introduce all the different cell types that you are going to find in the epidermis here so that we can talk about what they do. But then as we go through the different layers, you want to know which cell type is found in which layer. So I'll ask questions about each layer on the exam. So just starting, keratinocytes makes up somewhere around 90% of your epidermis. So the overwhelming majority of these cells over here are keratinocytes, so named because of the protein keratin that they produce. Then you have melanocytes. Um, they are going to be found down here among the cells of the stratum basale. Um, what is not illustrated over here are the Langerhans cells, which are now called dendritic cells. Um, if you look them up online, you'll probably have more luck with Langerhans because dendritic is a new term. And there are a number of different cell populations within the body that are called dendritic cells. So if you look up that term, uh, it's really easy to get confused. Um, but they are macrophages, so they are a specific type of cell that is derived from one of your white blood cells, and they phagocytize things. So they eat whatever's not supposed to be there, um, primarily bacteria, because um, dead skin cells here are just going to fall off the surface. And then this blue cell right here is supposed to be a tactile or Merkel cell. Do not confuse this with the tactile corpuscle, which would be located down here in the dermis. This is a smaller individual cell that works in concert with this other neuron here. So this blue thing is just a little sensory cell, and when it gets squished, it dumps neurotransmitter onto that yellow neuron there. All right, so... First up, the stratum basale, a.k.a. the germinativum, uh, because that is where your skin germinates or grows. So you want to know that that is where most of, or I should say all of, the cell division takes place in healthy skin. So cells are born in the stratum basale, move their way up through the layers as they age, and then when they get to the top, they die and fall off. You are also then going to find dispersed among your uh, mitotically active cells the Merkel discs and the melanocytes. So there's your blue Merkel disc and this grayish green melanocyte. Then you have the stratum spinosum. Um, it is so named because of the appearance of the pre-keratin fibers that are prominent in this part of the epidermis. Um, it doesn't look prickly under our microscopes. I think you have to have higher magnification and the proper stain to have it look prickly. It just looks like regular cells when we look at it, like this part right here. Um, this is where most of the melanin granules accumulate. So they're produced by the melanocytes in the stratum basale but then they get released and accumulate in the cells of the stratum spinosum where they form an umbrella above those cells protecting them from UV light. Uh, then also you want to know in and amongst the keratinocytes of the stratum spinosum will be your Langerhans cells or the dendritic cells of your skin. Next layer up is the stratum granulosum. This, if you do look at it closely in our lab or on some of the images that are available online this semester, um, it is dark and when you zoom in on it, you can actually see granules, little clumps of proteins, um, which is made out of something called keratohyalin. It is a combination of protein and lipids and maybe even some carbs. It's a complicated molecule um, and it is a water barrier. So your cells are not impermeable to water. Water can diffuse through them. So you want to have an extra layer outside of your cells uh, protecting from evaporation. We still evaporate plenty of water, but this just makes it such that we evaporate less. Uh, then you have the stratum lucidum, which means clear or light. Um, so if you're assessing somebody for a concussion, 
and they appear to be lucid, it means that they know where they are and they know what time it is and they can identify how many fingers you're holding up because they're clear headed. Um, that, as it says right here, is only found in thick skin because it is the layer in between the stratum granulosum and the stratum corneum and you only find this thick, well-defined stratum corneum in thick skin. Um, and yeah, just know the description of stratum lucidum and know that it's primarily associated with thick skin. And then stratum corneum, you can get a small stratum corneum in thin skin, but for the most part, you only see a well-defined stratum corneum in thick skin. This is what your calluses are made out of, and even just like your fingertips, which are a little bit firmer in texture than, say, the soft skin in the crease of your elbow, um, that's thick skin with a more enhanced stratum corneum. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and then just know that it's there for protection. Uh, here's the basement membrane again. I just, I know we did it in tissues. I want to bring it up again because as we're moving down through the skin, now we've come to the part where the basement membrane is. Um, so again, you want to think of it kind of like a chain link fence. Here you're zoomed way in on it, and it's just this yellow orangey layer here with all these other colors etched onto it. Um, over here, it's again, it's this, what is that, maroon grid with all of those other cells attached to it. Um, it's like a cargo net or a chain link fence that is going to separate, if we get here, right, your can't say it today, epidermis from your dermis. So later on when we talk about skin cancer, all of the skin cancer is going to originate in one layer of the epidermis or another. So when we talk about it spreading, we're talking about its ability to chemically disassemble the basement membrane and spread from the epidermis down into the dermis. Um, so Tumors in general, cancer, doesn't necessarily spread from one tissue to another just because the tumor is getting bigger and it's physically breaking down barriers. Generally what's happening is that it is developing the ability to produce enzymes that can disassemble chemically these basement membranes so that it can move without resistance from one tissue into another tissue. And you are going to see that there are times when it is normal for cells in your body to do that. And what cancer cells are doing is just developing um, what would be considered a normal cellular ability, but it's the wrong cell at the wrong time that's developing this ability. And it's a big part of what cancer is, it's just the wrong cells doing the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong place. But everything cancer does would be considered appropriate in a different time or a different place under different circumstances. Moving right along, sorry I was skipping around. Um, so we just went from the epidermis through the basement membrane into the dermis. This first very thin layer of the dermis here that kind of interdigitates with the epidermis is called the papillary layer. You want to know that it is composed of areolar connective tissue. As you will recall from chapter 4, this is the connective tissue that supports all of the epithelia within your body. Then just deep to the papillary layer, is what is called the reticular layer. This is the dense irregular connective tissue that I said I wanted you to know in lab. And this is going to contain, oh it doesn't say it, well it's got fibroblasts because they produce all of the collagen fibers and that's also the layer of, you, of the skin where you find most of the glands and follicles and corpuscles. And all of the blood vessels. You will recall um, epithelia are not vascular, so there's no blood vessels up here. They are innervated, 
as we've seen, because this is a neuron, this little blue cell. And there are also just free nerve endings. They don't have it here, but there are nerve endings that project up into your epidermis, just no blood vessels. So your papillary layer is quite vascular so that um, wastes and nutrients can diffuse back and forth between the epidermis and the dermis. Remembering, of course, that the basement membrane is not a barrier to diffusion. It's like a chain link fence. Lots of things can pass very freely across a chain link fence. Um, so, yeah, basically water passing back and forth across the basement membrane would be just like raindrops passing through the links of a chain link fence. Um, so that particular, what's up? Oh, and then melanin. Um, we end up talking about this so many different times because we talk about the melanocytes and we see it in lab. Um, so just to reiterate, um, it is a pigment, but its job is not to make your skin look better because we all look better with a little bit of melanin. It is there to protect your stratum basale from UV radiation. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't really care about this slide. Just know that you have some carotene in your skin, which gives especially your palms and the soles of your shoes a little bit of an orange hue to them. And hemoglobin is not necessarily a pigment for your skin, but because your dermis is highly vascular and right, you have lots of blood vessels in your skin to serve as a reservoir, um, you can see the color of hemoglobin through the skin. So when you flush, when your cheeks blush, that's hemoglobin. Um, so then we have to talk about all of the things that are derived from the epidermis but hang out in the dermis. Um, so glands, hair, nail follicles, or excuse me, hair, hair follicles, and nails. I don't think I have nails in the lecture because I really don't care about them. Uh, next up then, sweat glands. Um, there are two types of sweat glands. You've seen both of them, but only one of them you have to know how to identify in lab. That is the eccrine sweat gland. So this produces the kind of sweat that is meant to be used for thermoregulation. So again, these cells here are going to pump nitrogenous waste and electrolytes into the lumen and create a very salty solution in the lumen and then the water is going to flow out of the cells into the very salty solution by osmosis. So sweat is generated by pumping salts and metabolic wastes, which then creates an osmotic gradient wherein the water follows all of the salt out of the cells into the duct of the sweat gland and ultimately onto the surface of your skin. Um, then I don't have a picture of the apergrin sweat gland, in the practice anatomy lab, if you looked at that, the, what do they call it? Uh, this was called the sudoriferous gland in practice anatomy lab. So it is found in the axillary and anogenital region, so armpits. Um, and it's a little bit like a sebaceous gland in that in addition to producing just regular sweat, there is some fat and protein in there. Bacteria like to eat that fat and protein, and then they produce metabolic byproducts that give you your body odor. Right? This is why if you go to the gym and sweat a lot, right, you don't stink right away. If you, you know, by the time you shower within an hour or so of going to the gym, you don't develop body odor in an hour. It takes a while because your bacteria have to process what's in your sweat and turn it into these metabolic byproducts that produce your body odor. Then we have these two other types of glands here. So they are derived from apocrine glands, um, your earwax glands or ceruminous glands, and then the mammary glands as well are a derivative of apocrine sweat glands. Uh, so next up are the sebaceous glands. Um, so these are different than sweat glands. They're anatomically, they look similar, but they're different. 
Um, and we went over them in lab. They produce an oily secretion called sebum, um, which is somewhat bactericidal. It doesn't kill bacteria, but it prevents too many opportunistic bacteria from taking hold on the surface of your skin. Um, so here you have, this is a picture from lab with some sebaceous glands here and here for this hair follicle and that hair follicle. Then you have, here are some sweat glands, also smaller, darker, and another sebaceous gland here. Uh, hair, hair I really don't care about, um, but we do have to cover it. Um, so hair is mostly dead skin cells, so uh, a lot of keratin and dead cells all packed tightly together. The pigment is melanin. Uh, as I understand it, there are two types of melanin, eumelanin and pheomelanin. Um, one of them is just brown, and the other one is yellow to red, depending on how much sulfur, I think, ends up in it. I forget. So it's the relative amounts of eumelanin versus pheomelanin that determine what shade your hair is. Um, whether it's dark brown or black or blonde. Um, this we're just going to skip. I'm never going to ask you about these two types of hair. Um, you should be familiar with alopecia. Um, this is also called spot baldness. Um, if you have a dog sometimes, it's, it's um, more common in animals to just have little spots of hair or hot spots where the hair doesn't grow. Um, then if you have true baldness, this is male part of pattern baldness where the whole top of the head goes. That is called true or frank baldness. Um, this then brings us into skin cancer. Um, before we talk about cancer itself or skin cancer itself, um, there are two things that I want you to know about each type of cancer. So when we're going over them, um, you want to know which tissue type or cell type in the epidermis they originate, and then how invasive or how aggressive they are. So this is sort of the lens through which we want to know these three different types of cancer. Um, risk factors, which is what this slide actually says, um, we will address also when we do the case study, and we'll address it a little bit more thoroughly than we do here because I'm going to have you all do some research on that. Um, but one of the big factors driving your risk of skin cancer is exposure to UV radiation. So too much time in the sun without sunscreen on. And then anything that irritates your skin, especially if it kills off some skin cells, which then means the stratum basale has to start dividing faster to replace the skin that's been killed, right? The faster you divide, the more likely you are to make mistakes. This leads to mutations, and mutations lead to cancer. Um, so first up is basal cell carcinoma. This originates in the stratum basale cells um, and is the least aggressive of all of the three, um, which I find interesting that the cell population whose job it is to divide when the cancer starts there is the least dangerous of the three kinds. And, and it may just be that those cells are already set up to divide very carefully. They have a lot of protections in place already because they're dividing cells. It's harder to push them into malignancy or overaggressiveness. Um, so because they don't spread, because they generally don't break through the basal lamina or the basement membrane, you can just get rid of the carcinoma and it's not going to show up somewhere else or just regrow. Uh, then you have squamous cell carcinoma. As this says, this is going to originate in the keratinocytes of the stratum basale. Now, why it is more common on scalp, ears, and hands, I'm not really sure, except they get a lot of exposure. This is more aggressive than basal cell carcinoma, but not as aggressive as the last kind we're going to do, melanoma. Um, so you would have surgical remover, removal of the carcinoma, 
followed by radiation therapy, again because it spreads a little bit more. Um, and if you're not sure about the extent to which something has spread, and you don't want to cut away massive amounts of tissue, then radiation, even though it's damaging to healthy tissue, is not as damaging as um, surgically removing all sorts of tissue. Then you get to melanoma. This originates in the melanocytes um, and is, as this says here, highly metastatic. Um, this means it spreads quickly. And especially when we're talking about metastasis, if I go way back up, right, we're not talking about the tumor or the carcinoma just spreading from the epidermis into the dermis. With metastasis, individual cells from the tumor will break off, jump into a blood vessel, and then sneak off somewhere else in the body and create a brand new tumor distant from the site of the original tumor. Um, so this is what makes melanoma so dangerous, is that it has a tendency to metastasize, and then once a cancer has metastasized, you have to use chemotherapy, because you can't radiate the whole body, and you can't find all of the micromets, they're called, the new tumors that are really small, because they're just getting started. Um, so then you have to switch to chemotherapy, um, which has come a long way, but is still somewhat of a blunt instrument um, and has a, a lot of side effects and there's a lot of collateral damage to the body involved in chemotherapy or as a result of chemotherapy. Um, so that's melanoma. This is the one that our skin cancer case study is about. Um, if you are going to look at a mole and trying to decide whether it's dangerous or not, or whether it's likely to be or turn into melanoma, you use the ABCD rule. Um, I just put these two pictures in here. You don't have them in yours. This is the one from the previous page. Um, so A means asymmetry. Um, so if you look at this mole here, it is mostly round, so it's got right to left, top to bottom symmetry. Whereas this is wide here, narrow there, it's not at all symmetrical. Um, this has a regular border or semi-regular, it looks just like an oval. And then this comes in and out and left and right, like it looks like a continent or something. I think it looks like Eastern Europe. Um, but at any rate, this has an irregular border, this has a regular border, the irregular border is a bad sign. Um, this tends to have a uniform color, and it's light brown in color. Over here, there are two bad signs. One, it's not uniform in color. That's a bad sign. And then two, it's got a dark spot, and the dark spot especially um, is a bad sign. And then diameter, this one is small, this one is larger. The bigger a mole is, the more likely it is to develop into melanoma. So those are some of the risk factors. Elevation is sometimes also listed as a risk factor, E, um, but there are plenty of birthmarks or moles that do have some elevation to them. But if they're perfectly round and uniform in color, the way beauty marks are, or certain moles, they're generally not considered uh, worrisome. Um, burns, what do we care about burns? Um, so basically, you want to know the difference between a first degree, second degree, and third degree burn. Um, so we'll start with first degree burn. This means just the epidermis, and you're going to get, as it says here, redness, maybe a little bit of swelling, and some pain. So this is like your basic sunburn, is generally a first degree burn. With a second degree burn, this is where you get some damage to the dermis, which then causes a separation between the epidermis and the dermis, and that's where the blistering comes from. Then for a third degree burn, this burns through the epidermis and the dermis down into the tissues below, so it is a full thickness burn. Um, these are, so with this you actually get redness and charring. Initially there's not a heck of a lot of pain because you've burned off all of the nerve endings, uh, but then recovering from or healing from a third degree burn 
is very painful um, because you have to, you can't let it scab over, you have to let it heal from the bottom up. And so they have to peel the bandages off every day or every couple of days to prevent scabbing so that the skin can regrow. Um, and I used to have a picture of it, but I guess there's no reason to have that gruesome picture. Um, that's it. That's skin. Pretty straightforward. Um, so the next thing you're going to have to do is your skin cancer case study.